founder of Endurant Capital Management, Pierre Endurant, who joins us now. Pierre, thank you, first of all, for joining us. I mean, OPEC Plus is always rather exciting because they've surprised, you know, in the past, but actually, if you look at the price of oil, they've always been right. What are you expecting them to do this time around? So it's a bit tricky. So I think the Saudis would want to see higher prices. Um, but when you look at you know, current OPEC production or OPEC plus production or exports, um, over the last month or two, they've been the same as the average of the last year. So despite all the announcements of cuts, uh, OPEC plus as a group has not cut much production at all since last year. Saudis cut, but against that, we, and, and Russia margi did like marginal cuts, mm -hmm. but against that we had a lot more oil from Iran and more oil from, um, from Iraq and from West Africa. So overall, you know, like we, we haven't had like much uh, OPEC plus cuts. So I think the Saudis will probably want the other countries to cut as well. Um, so I think it's going to be a negotiation where they, they, the Saudis will probably use that lollipop cut as a, as a potential stick if the other countries don't cut more. And why I think we need a cut is actually we had much larger U.S. supply growth than expected this year. So we had you know, 1.5 million barrels a day total liquid growth relative to last year, which is one of like the in the top three supply growth uh, in history in the U.S. So the, uh, like we were expecting much lower, uh, much lower supply growth, mm -hmm. um, and also a lot of Iranian oil came back, and we didn't lose. Um, any Russian oil, pretty much, and we had more oil from Iraq and, um, and West but, Africa. Yeah, Pierre, so, so what does a meaningful cut actually look like that you think will be achieved? I mean, there's so much geopolitical uncertainty as well. I wonder whether everyone's a little bit in, in a wait-and-see situation. Yeah, I think in terms of geopolitical risk, people, you know, uh, wait for something to happen before positioning for it because no. I think so much money has been lost positioning for that and then nothing happened. So look, you know, last year, Russia invade, you know, invaded Ukraine and you know, we didn't lose any oil uh, and we got some SPR release. So actually it was a bearish event for the oil market. Um, since 2005, you know, people have been you know, um, positioning for a war with Iran and losing money because it never happened. Um, so I think um, the market generally tends to discount potential geopolitical risk, wait for the supply disruptions to happen and then the price moves. Uh, so I don't think it's over, and potentially we could have disruptions, but mm -hmm. they have not happened yet. Um, so I think we have to go back to fundamentals, looking yeah. at supply growth versus demand growth. Demand growth is very strong, so despite all the fears of um, a really weak macroeconomic outlook, demand growth this year is estimated to be around 2.3 million barrels a day, mm -hmm. which is twice the average, uh, an average demand growth. Mm -hmm. uh, so demand growth is not the issue, uh, and we still have some weak of we to... Uh, happen post-COVID because some countries have not fully re reopened, mainly in Asia. No. So, so I think there's still a bit more demand growth to come. But the supply has been the issue, a lot more supply than expected. But so, so you were, you actually started the year by calling, I think, oil to be at yeah. around $140 yeah. a barrel. Yeah. Are you sticking to that? or are you No, not to really, because um, bring it down because we had a lot more supply from Iran. I didn't expect, you know, the U.S. administration to close their eyes on uh, and to stop enforcing Iranian sanctions. So Iran exports pretty much as much as before the sanctions. Um, and U.S. supply growth is probably 800, 700 to 800,000 barrels a day, higher than expected. Um, and then we, we didn't lose oil from Russia. We, you know, we got more oil from Iraq and, South, and uh, so West what's Africa. So your forecast? You know, it will depend a lot on you know, what OPEC will do this weekend, right? So it's hard to stick your neck out in the market. Our markets right now are finely balanced. They are not, you know, massively oversupplied or undersupplied. It's like finely balanced. So uh, it's all at the margin. If OPEC does uh, a cut that's large enough, so I would say like a million barrels a day lower relative to current production, then the, ma then the market will go up. If they try to micromanage the market, you know, month to month, I think it will stay here or go a bit lower. And if the other OPEC members do not, you know, do like, you know, do not want to cut, and Saudi have to, you know, to be the only one cutting, I think they will give up and, and potentially bring some production back online, and then we'll go much higher. So it will depend a lot on that meeting. Uh, so I'll have probably a better opinion on Monday. <laughs> so you'll come back on Monday. Yeah. Um, Pierre, how's your fund doing? I know you, you've had some ups, you've had some yeah. downs. How difficult is it holding on, first of all, to your clients? Um, holding to the clients is okay for now um, because. Most of them have been with us for a very long time, so um, they've seen a lot of good years, um, and so they don't, you know, um, 
live at the first time, you know, of, uh, like we, we covered in the past of large drawdowns. It's just about being patient. I know that for me, the worst kind of markets are those kind of markets where there's no clear direction and it's very volatile. I mean, for the last year and a half, we have many times where oil prices would go down $10 in one or two days for no reason and then go back up. And so when you have like a strong view and then strong view means like a strong position, you end up being chopped by that volatility. And I've always done, you know, badly in those type of markets, but they tend to be maybe 10% of the time we have those markets. And then we have the markets that are more obvious where it goes in one direction for some time. And, and then that's when we, we tend to do well. So why do you think it's these kind of markets that we're living with? Is it geopolitics at the margins that are so difficult to read? Or is it actually countries that have behaved in, in ways that you weren't expecting? I think it's a lot of random events, right? As I said earlier, it's the fact that you have a lot of countries raising production at the same time. Yeah some cutting and, and basically it's, you know, at the end of the day what makes the oil price is, is uh, supply minus demand. When inventories go down strongly, prices will go up and vice versa. So when you're in a situation where you have the um, supply increase, you know, meeting the demand increase and there's a, a lot of, uh, um, and it's hard to forecast why the supply, what the supply increase will be next year and the demand increase and the markets are volatile and they don't go anywhere, and then that's when it becomes choppy. Yeah, what's your take on China? Again, this is the biggest of yeah. known. We saw foreign direct investment going into China, I think, negative for the first time since it's you know, since on record. Yeah. But it's unclear. Again, they're opening. We don't know how much support the government will actually give to, to some of these real estate developers. Well, it's, uh, I think they want to be careful because there's been so much speculation going into real estate. You know, like prices are just so high. So I think it's... Uh, I'm not sure they'll come with a bazooka. I think it's going to be like marginal help. Um, but for the oil market, I don't think that you know, the Chinese real estate market you know, is, is such a driver for, for, for oil. I mean, it can be like a marginal plus, but it's, it's not what's going to drive the market going forward. So what's your outlook for, for the oil markets in 2024? There's a lot, yeah. a lot of unknowns. Yeah, it's a lot of unknowns, so it's hard to, to have a strong uh, opinion now. So I think uh, it will depend a lot on what OPEC you know, decides on Sunday, really. Did, I mean, if we have to, uh, Trump back in the White House, does that change also the, the course of the, the price of oil or certainly how much they'll produce? Maybe. I, I don't think it will change anything for the U.S. supply because, you know, despite all the talk that, you know, Biden was hard on, you know, production growth, well, we have one of the top <laughs> production growth ever, like uh, in, in the U.S. So it's more driven by technological improvements and these kind of things. And, um, but where it can have an impact, if, if Trump was to come back and he goes hard on Iran mm -hmm. and he goes hard on Venezuela, then we lose some oil and it could be marginally positive for the oil price. So it's going to be more from you know, like foreign policy mm -hmm. than, than domestic uh, policy. But you're not, I mean, a lot of actually expecting a surplus in, you know, the oil because of the economy going down and uh, a lot of supply out there. Do you expect a kind of a, a significant downturn in some of the Western economies? Well, the thing is, um, when you look historically, if you have like a normal recession, like you don't lose much oil demand. You know, it's right. quite marginal. You lose like half a million barrels a day relative to an average year. Mm -hmm. And so it's nothing relative to what OPEC could cut or how much supply could disappoint. So I think on its own, it's not enough, like a weak economy or even a recession is not enough to bring prices down. But if you have a weak economy coupled with a very strong supply growth in the US and OPEC not cutting, then yeah, of course, it's negative for oil prices. But on its own, um, when you look historically, we had 08 to 09 uh, brought like a, a strong you know, demand de decline, but that was not because of a recession. It was a full-blown financial crisis, right? It's, uh, the world stopped. And then obviously the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. But when you look at average recessions, you don't lose so much uh, demand. Right. It's, it's quite marginal. But so, so if you look at the markets and the way there's positioning on the oil markets, but also in treasuries and everything yeah. else that you look at, mm -hmm. what are people misunderstanding? What are they getting wrong? I don't know if they're getting it wrong. I mean, so far, it's no more me getting it wrong. But the, I would say like the positioning for oil, the hedge funds are very short, or at least the speculative land is close to all-time low. Um, so I think they're looking at, I mean, it's hard to know what they're looking at because you have a lot of different funds. But, but I think the macro community in, in, in the U.S. is probably focused on uh, demand growth disappointing, like a weak economy to come, and then like weak... Uh, weak demand, but, but so far demand kept on being revised up, so they've been wrong on that, you know, on that point. Will it come next year? Maybe, maybe not, because I think there's still some 
uh, demand recovery from post-COVID to come, you know, like, uh, right. so I don't think demand will really be the issue, but the funds are actually quite short now, and they're short going into a big OPEC meeting, so, and I think the, you know, um, Prince Abdulaziz probably knows that they're short, and he might want to surprise them, but but I think it's uh, the other ones, will, the other countries will have to cut as well. Yeah, I mean, going into this big OPEC plus meeting, what do you do? How, how do you actually work? Do you take a big position before? You just wait and see and then decide? I think, I think it's better to wait and see. Um, I think it's more likely that it would be a bullish outcome, but there's also a low probability event that it might be a very bearish outcome. But I think it's more like a 10 or 15% yeah. probability in case the other OPEC members no, uh, do not want to cut. And so there's a 10% you know, probability maybe that we go much lower as well. So in, in a way, you, I think you probably want to be positive going into that meeting, but be careful of the sizing in case something bad happens. And generally, uh, the market doesn't price the news you know, right away. It tends to diffuse over time. So it's better to wait for the result, analyze it, and then if it's, if it's obvious, then put the position after. So interesting. Pierre, thank you so much. Founder there of Endurant Capital Management, Pierre Endurant.